in human trafficking because I am embarrassed to say that I really thought it was like the movie Taken and that it was a problem that affected all other parts of the world but not the United States. It never occurred to me that the girls that live in our community could be a victim of human trafficking. And it's not as um, glamorous or not glamorous as in the movies it is more of a problem that exists here in Dade County and it can exist just about anywhere. Some of the girls that come into my court are from very poor neighborhoods. Some of the girls come from Pinecrest, from Palmetto Bay, from the Gables. It does not matter. It does not discriminate. It does not have anything to do with any socioeconomic um, class of any type. Uh, this is not the court's problem. This is clearly our community's problem, and I'm very honored that you guys are interested in combating this problem. <coughs> the legal definition of human trafficking is a person intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly recruits, transport, transfers, harbors, receives, provides, obtains, isolates, maintains, or entices a, per a person for purposes of forced labor or commercial sexual exploitation. However, when it comes to children, you do not have to prove fraud, you do not have to prove force, and you do not have to prove coercion. The legislature and the state attorney has been absolutely awesome in helping out minors of human trafficking. They created um, Safe Harbor, which protects these children from prosecution, and it's really a very logical thing when you think about it, because obviously a 12-year-old is not willingly consenting to sex with a million men for money. That's something that just does not happen. Grace Court is the first trauma-informed court in the country. I've traveled to different places in the country, and lots of places do have courts that deal with human trafficking victims, but it's more in a delinquency uh, component. It's more kids that are picked up for shoplifting, for grand theft, for prostitution, whatever. And they are not prosecuted for the prostitution, or if they are, they give them community hours, they give them something to try and take the prostitution away. That's not what Grace Court does. Grace Court encompasses dependency, which is children that are abused, abandoned, or neglected. It encompasses delinquency, so if a child picks up a crime, it comes to me also, if there's a human trafficking component, obviously. And it encompasses the family case. So if a family is going through a divorce and the child is involved in human trafficking, it would also come to me. So every aspect of a child's life, if she's a victim or he's a victim of human trafficking, it comes to Grace Court. I usually say girls because the boys are not as identifiable. I have no doubt that there are many boys involved, but boys are cool, and it's cool that boys sleep around, so they don't admit when they are involved in human trafficking. The boys that I do have in my court are transgender, and the boys that I have in my court are forced labor. Mainly it's girls. So I'm going to tell you, uh, story of a typical case that would appear in front of me. Sophie is raised in extreme poverty in Miami. She lives with her mom and her siblings. Her mom is single. Her mom goes from job to job because she can't keep a job. She has various boyfriends. Mom goes out and many times leaves Sophie with the boyfriends. Sophie is four the first time that one of mom's boyfriends sexually abuses her. She's then six when the next boyfriend sexually abuses her. Her mother is physically and emotionally unstable. She's abusive to Sophie. She um, tells her that she's not worth anything. She tells her when she when Sophie tells her about the sexual abuse that it's probably her fault that she looked for the men that it's not the men's fault. She's six when this happens. So at the age of twelve, Sophie runs away. She's put in foster care. Children in foster care run away constantly. And it's not that obviously human trafficking happens in foster care, but it's a very vulnerable population. And it happens more often than not in foster care. When she begins to run away, she shoplifts, she uses drugs, she skips school, and she meets Ron, 
a gentleman that appears very nice at McDonald's when she is asking someone for food. Ron tells her all the things that her mom should have told her, that she's beautiful, that she's wonderful, that she's smart, that she can do everything she wants to in life, and they begin to spend a lot of time together. Ron eventually tells her that in order for to make this relationship work, as all relationships, it's a two-way street, and she's got to do something too. She's 14, so the way she has to contribute to the relationship is sleeping with 10 to 12 men a night. Hmm. She is branded as if she's an animal. Um, when I first started doing this, there was a little girl that came into court, and she was 12, and she would not look at me no matter what. And I had called the sidebar so I could talk to her in private so it would not embarrass her in front of everybody else. And there was no way I could get eye contact. And I think eye contact is very important, particularly with a child, and you like connect. And so I asked her to please look at me, and she would not. And finally I realized it's because her eyelids had been tattooed by the pimp, and she didn't want me to see them. So she kept going like that and putting her hair above it and hiding her eyelids. Um, when this case comes to court, my hypothetical, Sophie is clearly very rude, very defiant. She curses to the attorney, she curses to the court. It's a very difficult situation because obviously she has been abused since she's been four years old. And we have to realize that when these kids come into the system, it's a lifelong trauma that they have suffered. She will get a therapist in court that will follow her wherever she ends up going. Children in foster care, their placements are disrupted many, many times. The therapist will follow her to wherever she goes. If she runs away, it's not like in other cases that they change the therapist. The therapist will wait for her, obviously have other cases, but the therapist will continue to follow that case. I will also appoint an attorney at Lightham to represent Sophie because it is the only time, the way I see it, that she will have a voice and she will feel that she's finally being heard. And obviously the attorney can be a little bit more articulate than she can be. Um, these kids, not all of them, it's a very frustrating um, division. They run away a lot, they use a lot of drugs, there's a lot of Baker Acts, Marchman Acts. Um, it's an upward battle. I mean, it's really very difficult, but there are some girls that do it. Fits. I have a girl that got a full scholarship to UF. Um, there's children that are now raising their own children because unfortunately they have babies left and right. Many of them lose their babies, but a lot of them have been able to keep their babies. So that's basically how the court works. Just to give you an idea of the numbers, 1.6 million children run away from their homes in the United States. One in every three teenagers that runs away within 48 hours will be recruited by a pimp. And the average age of entry into human trafficking, unfortunately, is 13 years old. I think Brenda probably spoke to you guys about the safe harbor. So I don't know if you want me to talk about it or not. It's basically a statute that was enacted that will not prosecute children for prostitution. Grace Court, we wanted to come up with a name because when I first started doing it in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, it was not a formalized. Mm -hmm. And basically what I started getting was just girls that ran away all the time. And for someone that went to law school, you don't want to deal with all day long, run away, pick up order, quash the pick up order, and that's all you do. It's not very legally challenging. So we wanted to come up with something that we would make it more a court that would service the children. I did not want to call it human trafficking court because nobody wants to come in to human trafficking court. So we came up with the name GRACE, which stands for Growth, Recover, Acceptance, Courage, and Empowerment. And as I stated before, it follows under the Unified Family Court model, which has been mandated by the Supreme Court, that every aspect of the child's life will come into my court. It's also trauma-informed. We give training to the attorneys, to my bailiff, to the clerks, because um, when you get a child that 
is rude, that comes dressed as if, I don't know, she woke up and rolled out of bed and that's how she comes to court, it's very hard to always be trauma-informed with them. You want to tell them, it's like, put on some clothes and why are you talking to me this way? So we've had to learn to change our vocabulary. We've had to learn to, um, it's not really being kind, but being more trauma-informed to deal with their trauma. So we do do a lot of training. And the attorneys that also get the cases, we require that they get training also on human trafficking. We work with a lot of different partners. I'm just gonna obviously go through this very quickly, but everybody's involved in it. The foster care system, which is run by our kids, the Department of Children and Families, the police is very involved when we do pickup orders. They are very, very um, conscientious of trying to find these girls because they know that they're not just your typical runaway, that many times they are in danger. There's, um, for example, a place down by Caribbean Boulevard. It's an apartment <coughs> building that apparently the slang for it is the prison because it looks like a prison and it is rumored that a bunch of the girls are being kept there. So they have a stink force put together to try and find them. So what I'm trying to say is that the community has really come together to help the court system in servicing these children. Mm -hmm. I think we went through this, the kind of cases that come before me. Trauma-informed training is so very important because, an example, I appointed someone that I went to law school with, a very um, Catholic, conservative, self-righteous male attorney to represent one of the girls. And he's wonderful. I would never ever point him again on a human trafficking case. Because he would look at the girl as everybody is trying to report in very nice ways what she's going through. Nobody says she's sleeping around, she's prostituting. They say something like she's um, involved in risky behavior. Her health could be in danger because of the risky behavior that she's involved in. Something to that aspect. He would look at her with this face of disgust and just like patronizing, judging her, and he would say something like, I really don't know what we're gonna do with a judge. She just doesn't listen to anybody. Hmm. And it was just re-victimizing her again. And we use him, without his name obviously, as an example of why the training is so very important. And it's very difficult. It's, it's very difficult because you wanna like slap them and tell them, you know, hello, there's something better there for you. But it's extremely important. I've had, um, my bailiff is very trained because as you know, or most of you probably know, courts in the United States are open. The only type of cases that are closed to the public are termination of parental right trials. So these cases are almost like Jerry Springer many times and everybody <laughs> wants to sit in and watch and see what's happening and, and you never know who's in the audience. So my bailiff has been trained to very nicely tell people, if you don't mind, the judge really hates the noise, can you step outside or something because we don't know who's in the audience. Um, very recently I had a young girl, she's 14, she is extremely defiant. She does not want to live with her father no matter what. Her mom is MIA, and she wants to live with her grandfather. I have a very soft heart for elderly people and babies or little kids. And I thought it would be a perfect place because she really wants to live with grandpa, and grandpa came to court, and he just sat in the audience very quietly, and he looked like grandpa, like your typical grandpa. He was probably in his 80s, he was very sweet looking, very meek looking, and all of a sudden I see all my attorneys, their faces like changing totally, and they're like, could we have a sidebar? And we have a sidebar, and I was told that grandpa, in her mind, is grandpa, but he's not really grandpa. And I'm like, so what's the big deal? I mean, I grew up with a step-grandfather, and I loved him like if he was a grandfather, who cares? Like, no, no, you don't understand, he was the pimp. Oh. So we have to be very conscientious of the people that come to court. We have to try and get them out. We don't want also, obviously court, <coughs> there's many, many cases. You have to move quickly. There's a practicality when the Department of Corrections brings in the girls 
or the Department of Juvenile Justice brings in the girls, I try and keep one in court at a time because they recruit one another. They um, know what I get upset about, so then the next one knows what to say or not to say because they play with my mind. They think I don't realize it. You know, so it's all these little innuendos and challenges that we go through daily. <laughs> this is just, we can move on. <laughs> Placement options for these girls. That's a very, very big challenge. Some of them stay at home, but some of them at home is where their triggers are to get them involved again. So many of them are placed in foster care. There's also specialized therapeutic foster care that deals solely with the issue of human trafficking. There's group care, which is more girls or boys, if it's a boys foster care, um, put together. That is very good in the sense that it has 24-hour therapists on call and therapists there. However, the downfall is that they recruit one another <coughs> and they run away together and things of that type. And there's also what we call SIP, which is a statewide inpatient psychiatric program. It's probably one of the hardest things that you need to do as a judge because lots of these girls have mental health illnesses they um, have so much trauma that they will be seen by a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist will recommend that what they need is inpatient psychiatric care. It's very, very difficult to have a hearing, hear expert testimony, the child is totally at loss what's going on and at the end you have no legal choice other than to put the child in a psychiatric um, unit. They're there usually for a year most of the time, nine months to a year. We have to review it legally and with the experts every 90 days. But it's um, very difficult because when they become defiant, they're restrained. I don't see that obviously, but you read it in the reports and it's very difficult to tell a child that that's where they need to go. So um, usually the way the cases work <coughs> is the cases first identified. I don't choose the cases that come in front of me. They are blind filed like in any other division. It's the juvenile division. It's now changing actually this month. It's changing their makeup totally. We are being combined. The juvenile, de the dependency, the delinquency, and the family cases that involve children are being all combined together, which is the way that it should have always been done because in reality, what ends up happening is that the child goes in front of three different judges. So this way, it's going to go in front of one judge. If the case, when it comes in, it is identified as human trafficking, it will uh, automatically come to my court. If it is assigned to another judge because of blind filing, whether it be a delinquency or a dependency or a family case, if that judge throughout the life of that case identifies it as human trafficking, it will go to a multidisciplinary <coughs> staffing with our kids and they will identify it. And if it is truly human trafficking or at high risk, then it will be transferred to my court. A shelter petition will be filed most of the time if there's a dependency. The statute has been enacted to include kids that are commercially sexually exploited. So before years ago, a child that would come into dependency would simply be a child that would be abused, neglected, <coughs> or abandoned. Now there is a provision for children that they may come from the perfect little household. Clearly not perfect, this is what the child is involved in. But what I'm trying to say is no abuse, no abandonment, no neglect, but the child is a victim of commercial sexual exploitation, a shelter petition can be filed. Um, and then we determine where the child ends up going placement-wise. The case takes the life like any other cases. There's trials, there's hearings, everything the same, it's just that we try and approach the case in a more trauma-informed way. Issues that we see in Grace Court all the time that you don't see in every other court. Tons and tons of runaways. So we have to issue pickup orders whenever a child is missing for more than 24 hours. Um, we quash pickup orders so that the police can stop looking for them. And sometimes I call it the rotating door because there's some girls that just run away constantly. There's some girls that have been on run for over a year, which is very, very um, disheartening that they're probably in Dade County, they're probably right here, and we cannot find them no matter what. There's also a lot of mental health issues, and there's a lot of Baker Acts. Um, there's a lot of 
children that attempt suicide. There's a lot of children that succeed in suicides, as I'm sure you heard with the Facebook <coughs> video case. Um, <coughs> children that are just very defiant and they meet the criteria for a Baker Act. So there's a lot of Baker Act. There's also a lot of substance abuse issues. We have an awful system for substance abuse. The Marchman Act is, and I don't know if everybody's familiar with it, you can stop me and I'll stop. But if you're not, the Marchman Act is a statute that allows you to come before a court and say that a child is in danger and cannot make decisions for themselves. You can do it for adults too, but it's harder, um, and therefore that child needs some type of substance abuse evaluation, treatment, or what have you. The statute has no teeth in it. The kids don't know, but they realize it quickly. It's not a lockdown facility. So even if you grant the Marchman Act, they go to a substance abuse, they get evaluated for seven days, and if they're really smart and conniving, they can walk out. It has no um, teeth to it. There's no good substance abuse uh, programs in Dade County for children. There's very few programs that will deal with substance abuse and mental health. And then they want to um, medicate children so then the kids feel like zombies. And it's just a vicious circle that does not work. It's awful, the treatment that we have for substance abuse. And teen pregnancy. In my mind, no matter how long I have been doing this, I do not understand in the mind of a pimp why it would be profitable for one of your workers, I guess, to get pregnant. I don't understand, but they do it all the time. They get the girls pregnant. To me, it seems that it would hurt their business, for lack of a better word, because people are not as attractive when they're pregnant. Um, many people have morning sickness. You are out of commission once you give the child, uh, give birth to the child. Obviously, he's not going to give her six weeks off. But you know what I'm saying. And children recuperate immediately. I mean, their bodies are back within a few weeks. But it doesn't make sense to me why they would do this. But they do it all the time as I guess a form of ownership, a form of threats. Your child, you know, you'll lose your child. You won't see your child. The teen pregnancy is awful, and most of the girls, unfortunately, end up in a termination of parental rights because they clearly, at 14, 15, and with the life they lead, they cannot raise their children. Um, a few of them have been able to get their kids back. A few of them have been put in what are, what are called mommy and me programs, and um, they're doing well, but it's the, the my, minority. Um, I want to give you some statistics because many people say they want to help. Many people think, oh my God, how could this be happening here? But at the end of the day, they really don't think that it affects our community. This is Human Trafficking Month, as you all know, and the awareness that we are trying to bring to human trafficking is immense. But let me give you some statistics so that um, you understand how bad the problem is. There's 6,100 homeless students in Miami-Dade schools. They're registered in school, and there's 6,100 homeless kids. It's a $150 billion industry worldwide. A lot more profitable than drug trafficking. And drug trafficking, at the end of the day, you sell the drugs once, and it's over children you get to sell over and over and over. Kids ages 6 to 18 spend about 2,000 hours a year with their, with their parents. They spent 11,000 hours in school and they spent 50,869 hours on social media. That's a lot of hours that people don't know what your kids are doing on social media. The media spends about $17 billion a year to attract children. And that's one of the biggest ways that the traffickers get on children. Um, we have a lot of work to do, but we've come a long way. Things have improved greatly. Camila's House has opened a shelter for young adults. They call it Phoenix Project. Unfortunately, there's not one for children, but there's one for young adults. Um, UM has developed a clinic to treat uh, victims of human trafficking, the Thrive Clinic, 
and they give them free dental work, free medical work, so it's very, very good. Uh, Texas, Canada, and D.C. have come to visit our court to learn about how Grace Court works and see if they can copy it in their jurisdictions. In 2012, there were 3,409 known cases of human trafficking in the state. Now there are 8,042, so that means we're identifying them more. In 2012, there were only 1,281 survivors. In 2016, we had over 2,000 survivors. The Dade County State Attorney's Office, I'm sure Brenda told you because she tells everybody and it's something to be very proud of. In 2011, they had only three known cases. They now have 424 cases. So the prosecution of the cases is much higher. It's hard to prosecute them because the victims are the children. It's very hard to get children to testify, to be credible witnesses. Mm -hmm. uh, the state of Florida, as you may know, has depositions in criminal cases, and it's very traumatizing for a child that not one attorney is asking them questions, but if there's various attorneys, because there's various defendants, all of them are asking them questions. The kids don't always stick around, and therefore the state attorney has to drop the cases. But we have had many of our girls <laughs> testify, and they have been responsible for some of the convictions that the state attorney can brag about. So this is an opportunity for all of us to take some action. Um, we, we always ask the community to be aware. You can tell many times a child that's involved in human trafficking. If a child comes from a middle class family, there's no reason for a 15 year old or a 16 year old to all of a sudden be carrying a Louis Vuitton purse, um, a Chanel purse. That doesn't usually happen in middle class families, particularly for a 15 or 16 year old. If a child has a new phone every other week as they come into court and the parents didn't buy it, that's a red flag. The child has tattoos that no one authorized. And um, many times the tattoos are very telling. They will have names, they will have brands. That's very telling. A child that runs away a lot, a child that all of a sudden had wonderful grades and now their grades are sliding. Something has happened. So I would ask that everybody keeps your eyes open and little by little, I always say save one child at a time because I can't save them all, and none of us can. Okay, thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. If you're doing minors, I guess that's 18 and under. What happens if you're involved with a minor when, you, when they bring them in, and then they're aging out? What, what do you do? They can, well, if they're in the dependency system, they can choose to have extended foster care which goes into their 20s, 22 if I'm not mistaken, and they will still receive services. Most of the providers that we work with are willing to give them services <coughs> after they are 18, but I don't see them any longer. And if it's a delinquent case, we have jurisdiction until they're 19. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I know you said that a number of the girls don't go to school with they stop at a certain point. But do you have coordination with Dade County Public Schools? Yes. And how does that work? Well, we have the Dade County School Board has an office in our building. So they help the girls in getting into whatever school system will work for them. I'm a true believer in education, and I think that the kids should go to school all day long. I don't believe in, I don't even know if it exists anymore, but when I was in school they had, um, what was it called, work study, and you could go like three classes and then work or whatever. I'm not into any of that. Mm -hmm. I don't like virtual school, and I don't like homeschooling, I don't like any of that. But for these girls, many times that's what you need to do. GED to me is a waste, but if she is 16 and in eighth grade because she has missed school for so long, maybe the GED is the best thing for her. So the Dade County School Board helps us by talking to the girls and seeing what program fits best with them. Sometimes virtual school is the best thing for them. And I don't know if this is exactly your field, but do you know what Dade County Schools is actually doing in terms of education for the kids? And if, if so, at what age do they actually start 
doing things with sex. The problem is that some schools have very strong PTAs. And the PTAs in certain schools, particularly in the better neighborhoods, do not want this to be discussed because this could not possibly happen to our children. And it does. So um, the superintendent is very gun ho about educating them. It has begun in high school and in many middle schools. We are pushing very much for it to start in elementary. Because obviously you can't talk to an elementary child with the terminology that we used. But you can talk to them about certain things. And you can talk to them about risks that they could be exposed to. Because there's kids that have been recruited when they were nine years old. So that is elementary school. So they need to be aware of it. However, the PTA fights very much against it. Yes. Can you tell me something about the policy the state of Florida has, and also Miami-Dade County has, as far as prosecuting the pimps? concern. I mean, one of the things that I feel emotionally when I hear you speak is a rage against the pimps and the terrible things that these parasitic <clears throat> humans do to others. What happens to the pimps? Well, they prosecute with them when they can find them. The problem and, and, is finding what them. Is, what does that mean when you say prosecute them? What are the, what's, the, what's the punishment? I the mean, punishment now is up to life. Oh, wow. The legislature changed and the punishment now is up to life. And I had one girl that um, testified against her pimp in federal court and he got 35 years. He wasn't able to get life because of some problems in her testimony and they weren't only able to prove a certain amount of it. But they, they're very, very strict um, punishments and penalties for pimps now. Now, what Kathy Fernandez Rundle is trying to do, and I think it would be a wonderful, wonderful idea, is to prosecute the buyers. Because it is like anything else in supply and demand. Everything in life is supply and demand. To follow the Rotary Club, what could you see that we might be able to do as we try to take on the task of combating uh, human trafficking in Miami-Dade County? What specifically could we as a Rotary Club I think the biggest thing would be awareness. And I don't know how you can promote the awareness, but I think awareness, not just to this group, but to everybody. Um, we go to dinner with friends or whatever, and it's a conversation that we have, and everybody is more aware of it. And I think if the community as a whole is more aware of it, um, we will end up protecting the children more. And when you see something that doesn't make sense, reporting it, like everything else, like the terrorist attacks, mm -hmm. like anything else, just reporting it. I think if um, we can't all save the kids, we can't um, build a substance abuse residential program for all of these kids, but I think awareness is where we all need to start. Yes, sir. Judge, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for, for doing God's work. Thank you. Um, it's a very emotional issue for me. Um, I, I did want to follow up on a, on a question that, that Tom had. I wrote down the Eagle Clinic, Camilla's House, the Guardian Program. Do you see us as citizens uh, volunteering or raising funds for those um, institutions? Of course. That would be helpful. Uh, and the, the only other question I have is, um, there is an abolitionist society in Orlando. It's a mm -hmm. nonprofit. Yeah, Tom Lawrence. Um, I'm trying to get in touch with them. And They're a wonderful, wonderful organization. Why isn't there an abolitionist society in my? Own? I don't have the answer. <laughs> and you, you know what? There's so many things that I'm restricted from doing. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if there was one. If I could even be a member of it, because I'm supposed to be impartial. So you should see. You know, I don't have a very good poker face. When people come into court and I can tell, you know, what they're doing or there's so much um, familial pimping, it, it mm. astonishes me because I grew up in a very Catholic Cuban household that my mom would have protected me against anything. Um, the only man she let me sit on the lap of was my dad because God forbid, mm -hmm. you know, and it was so much protection. And I see these mothers come into court and they're the ones that are pimping their daughters. 
to me it's um incredible there's so many things that i'm restricted from doing i don't know why we don't have that type of program and i don't know if i could be involved in it so um i talk to tom laris a lot i don't know if it's just that he's very active we have a task force with the state attorney that many people do not have many other jurisdictions and that's wonderful because the um, Dade County Schools, I'm on it, the state attorneys are on it, the Guardian Act program's on it, Camila's house is on it, and that's how we try and combat it. I don't know if because of that, then we don't have the other. I don't have an answer, I don't know. <coughs> okay. Thank you, Jess. Just one, one, one last quick question. Of course. Um, I, I can tell when I hear you speak, you speak with considerable emotion about this topic. And my guess would be that having the job you have takes an emotional toll. Is there a sort of standard period of time that judges serve the positions that you do? Are there the, the positions that you do? I mean, is there sort of a, a time limit, a threshold beyond which a person just can't take it? Well, every six years you got to run. So if you lose. <laughs> um, you're obligated to stay in any division for at least three years. I'm associate administrative judge of juvenile, so I don't have to move after the three years. Up to now, I have been able to do it. Up to now, I have been able to separate once I get home. I'm very grateful for my children. I find them now almost perfect compared to the kids that see I see in court, and then I get upset about their grades and things like that. But what I'm trying to say is I've been able to separate both. I have not been able to find anybody even to be my backup judge in case I'm sick, in case I um, get recused on a case. So I have no idea if I can ever give it up because nobody wants to do it. Everybody finds it depressing. I don't find it depressing. I find it, um, it's sad. It's terrible that our community has this problem. But I always see the, the glass half full. And they've come a long way. And if I didn't do it, and nobody else wants to, then who would service these children? So I don't have an answer. There, There is no magic number or magic time limit. I guess when you get burned out, you have to move on. And then I don't know what would happen to the court. Um, I try and take time off. <laughs> and I try and enjoy my weekends a lot because Mondays is my grace court day, Mondays and Wednesdays, so those are the toughest days. The other days I have regular cases. So I do get the, that cute little kid that runs up to me and wants a little teddy bear or adoption. It's wonderful when a child's been abused and a new family adopts them. I have happy moments too. It's just a balance. Uh, <clears throat> I go way back, I mean, Charlie Manson, of course. You know, I had all those girls from middle uh, income class families and they were all teenagers at the time that he developed them. You think that in one of his controls of drugs, you think the legalization, the legislatures take that in consideration for the legalization of marijuana? You think that's gonna affect California and it's gonna eventually come this way? It's gonna be a very, very, very bad adverse effect to getting these pump pimps will use this as a, uh, a stepping stone to getting these, women, these young girls. I don't know. Many um, schools of thought say that marijuana is just the gate to everything else. These girls, when they're positive on marijuana, are more or less celebrating it, and I've never been a proponent of marijuana, but the drugs that they usually do are much, much heavier than marijuana, so it's like, okay, pop, it's okay, honey, you're doing so much better. <laughs> and we celebrate like little things like that because they will be positive for opiates, benzos, cocaine, heroin, so when they're positive for marijuana. I don't know, I have very mixed feelings about it. Sometimes I think that if they legalize it, then maybe the thrill of it will not be there for children, but I don't know enough about it to know if it's just a gateway to everything else. And has STDs ever been emphasized too among the community and the state that you know, can catch you know, disease and whatever? I, I don't know, you said the girls get pregnant, is that the John's child or is that the child? That Either. The, For many times it's the John's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that means there's no protected sex. So <laughs> there's no protected sex. And there's you. so many girls with STDs mm -hmm. and with AIDS and babies. Babies that are born with STDs and AIDS. That's, it's absolutely awful. 
I, I, that's something else that I don't understand why the Johns don't protect, have the girls protect themselves because it seems to me that they could use them more if the girls are healthy. I don't know. Hmm. It's a, a class of people we will never understand. I think. It's the demographics of the girls. I mean, all. Yeah. There's a lot of African American girls, but there's a lot of Hispanic girls. Anglos, I would say, are the least, but. Um, I have at least a handful from Palmetto Bay that are your typical annual American girl hmm. from what we see as a traditional household, a mom and a dad and a traditional household. But there's a lot of um, very poor African American girls. And those girls, unfortunately, I think it's not all of them, obviously, many of them are generational. You know, the mom was involved, the dad, the grandma was involved, and it's just generational. And children, like everybody, they do <clears throat> what they have seen. And if that's what they saw mom do, how can then mom say it's wrong? You know, she was doing it too since she was 12. 